Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Green. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are so elated to have you with us tonight. We are still in the book of Deuteronomy, going through the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch, are commonly referred to as the Law of Moses, and we are getting through. We're making good time. Uh, and I, as I prepared this, I get more and more enthusiastic about the Word of God. I've come to realize that everything that has been written about the Word of God being, about the Bible being the Word of God, I'm more and more convinced of. So I just, I'm just so grateful for having the opportunity to share this little time with you people every week. God has been blessing me. I hope I've been blessing y'all. And um, let's just get started for tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of standing before your people one more time, sharing the good news, sharing the unadulterated word of God. So we ask you for clarity of mind and thought that we may apprehend and comprehend these great truths, that we might become better stewards of the mystery of God. So we thank you. We praise your name tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we begin tonight at Deuteronomy chapter 23. Chapter 23 begins, uh, it, the, it begins with a, this first section about those who are excluded from the assembly. Now, let me tell you something. What, what I have come to realize, if we would adopt a biblical standard, I think America would be a whole lot, I mean, the whole world would be better off. But I'm looking at God's plan, you know, and this, we got this, this very contentious election coming up here in America, and one of the most divided issues is on immigration. And immigration was a problem during the time of, of the Old Testament. Remember, the children of Israel were strangers in the land of Egypt. God rescued them. He delivered them out of Egyptian bondage and brought them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he reminded them over and over and over again, don't forget that you were once pilgrims, you were once strangers, in a, in a foreign land. And when you look at, look at immigration from the biblical mindset, I think a lot of the contentious politicking that takes place right now, if we develop a more biblical approach to immigration, we'd have a, our country would be a lot better off. So here he, we start um, 23, verse 1. He gives us, we're starting out with this list of people. The first eight verses of chapter 3, he gives us a, a, a litany, so to speak, of, of those who are not to be considered part of the assembly. Okay, now what does that mean to the modern day church? To the church? To, to modern day society. How does that apply to modern day society? Because uh, some of this looks, you know, it's just pure, it's pure Jewish, pure Jewry. It, it applies only to the Jews. We can't make an application to modern day life. Because God has some reasons for his, especially right here in verse 1, his reason for excluding this group, or this, this category of individuals 
primarily men that would not be that could not enter into the commonwealth of Israel that would never be accepted as members of the society that could never take part in the the worship the ministry uh, in anything that had to do with the temple uh, they could not be a part of the assembly so whenever you as you're reading the Old Testament and you see the word the congregation he's talking about Israel as a whole this is the national identity you cannot become a, a part of our nation. And, and this, this first verse here just kind of blew me away when I saw this because it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. He that is wounded in, his, in the stones or he that has his private member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. My goodness. Somebody done had they they, they <coughs> had their nards disconnected from their body. Boy, I tell you. <laughs> when I read that, I just started laughing. Okay? I think God got a sense of humor. He said, he don't want somebody with his stones crushed. Okay? Don't, you can't be part of the congregation. Guess what? Somebody who won't, who done had their stones crushed got a lot worse problems than um, than be one of being with, with, with a, a member of the church. Okay? I mean, when I read that, I can get on the laugh. I said, Lord, that's between you. That, that, Lord, that's on you. If that's what you say, okay. So, and that, that, was, that only applied to that generation. Okay? So not enter, and, and, I, and I suspect the reason for that is because the ability to procreate to be fruitful and multiply. See, when you no longer had the ability to procreate because your, your manhood was either removed by force or you had it done because you wanted it done. Because there was this, there was this uh, category that they called the eunuch. And then what, what uh, you know, for what, in the ancient world, someone that worked in the house of royalty, you would have your male slaves castrated. So they couldn't mess with your children. You wouldn't mess with your daughters. Because they had access to them. So they had them castrated. So someone who had been, now they used that same terminology for anyone who was in a position of stewardship. A eunuch, like the Ethiopian eunuch that uh, we read about in uh, the book of Acts. Uh, I think that was chapter 7 when Philip was going out um, and he saw this Ethiopian eunuch from the uh, uh, who served as a treasurer for Queen Candace of Ethiopia. He was a eunuch. So they used that term eunuch to describe anyone who had a fiduciary responsibility to a royal household. He, he was a eunuch. He was not necessarily had been castrated and made a eunuch. He just had that 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 category that that um, that title eunuch. That's that's what the scripture called it. He wasn't. Not every eunuch had been castrated. I just want to get that point. But those who had cannot be a member of the congregation. Okay? Look at verse 2. And a bastard should not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Uh, why was that? Because he wanted the, the remember we said this the last time, all of these Old Testament laws, God wanted a holy people. And he was stressing holiness. I am a holy God. But guess what? God is still a holy God. Now, we live in the 21st century, and holiness is a bad word in our society. Somebody living too holy, we're going to talk about them. Uh, see, holiness and righteousness are two sides of the same coin, but guess what? Um, 
But there's a right way to do holiness. We can't beat folk across the head with our holiness, expecting them to be holy the way we are right now. Because people grow in grace at different stages, at different levels. They advance. Uh, you, you, you go from faith to faith. Not everybody's level of faith is the same. You can't expect everyone to live as disciplined as you right now. They may get there, but at the, the, see, well, the day you get born again, the day you get saved, you still going to have the same old appetites until the Holy Spirit teaches you how to curb those appetites. Anybody ever got high, their brain going to remember what it felt like to be high. So you have to learn how to stay avoid situations where you're going to be around folk who might want to slip you a joint or, or offer you a hit until you get strong enough to say no. In the meantime, you need to quarantine yourself away, stay away from that environment until you get strong enough. If you are a recovering alcoholic, the last thing you need to do is live two blocks, two uh, uh, houses down from a bar. That's the last thing you need. You need to get on the other side of town for a while. And, 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 and that word bastard, basically, that's anyone, the offspring of infidels. And if you read, uh, you go to Leviticus, go back to Leviticus chapter 18, read the whole chapter. If anyone that was a product of any of those situations from Leviticus 18. Or you normally have, you call a bastard someone whose mom and daddy wasn't married. That's eighty percent of America's population that's born after uh, nineteen seventy. The out of wedlock birth rate in America is so high. Most of our children are bastards by this definition. But this was under the Old Testament economy. Uh, we, uh, in, in this economy, in this, uh, the time in which we live right now, under the, in the age of grace, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. I always go back to e Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh, when uh, Israel was found as a nation, that father was an Amorite and that mother a Hittite. Ain't a, a, a much more bastard than that. Two heathens who didn't know God. But I saw you, I looked upon you, and I saw you, and you became mine. This is what God told the children of Israel. Read uh, Ezekiel 16. So, the, 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 the offspring of infidels could not, when he says a member of the congregation, he's primarily dealing with leadership in the, in the ranks at the temple. You, could, it, it, you were disqualified. If your mom and dad were married, you, you, you're disqualified. Your offspring would be disqualified. Uh, so, and that's just the way it is. That's just the way it was. And, and the Amorite, look at verse 3. And the Amorite and the Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Not just the tenth generation, but forever. Now, now, what about the individual Amorite or Moabite? The individual Amorite or Moabite you would include. And this is basically dealing with the men, not the women. This is basically dealing with a, 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 an Amorite man could not marry a Jewish woman. A, a Moabite man uh, 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 could not marry a Jewish woman. But a Jewish man could marry a Moabite woman. And she becomes a proselyte. Proselyte is someone who becomes a Jew through the same way we become Christians. By accepting the faith. By making the decision 
to, to walk away from idols and turn to the true and living God. That's why we call, we're witnessing to people right now, it's called proselytizing. So someone who was who came from another uh, uh, nationality, another um, people group, became began to to accept and adopt the Jewish faith. They were called proselytes, the strangers. Now, if you ever doing a word study, you look up that word stranger. Usually, if you want to understand what God thinks about the stranger. Uh, just do a, a word search. Put the word stranger in, and oftentimes you will see the word stranger. It's going to come up at the same time the congregation, the assembly, members of the assembly, and the stranger. God will put them in the same boat. See, once God, He accepts the stranger. See, th this, is, this is what makes me understand what God's treatment of immigration, what if our immigration policy was. Uh, was, was Aligned with this scriptural purpose, uh, you wouldn't be talking about folk uh, wanting to um, ostracize them poor Haitians in that town in Ohio, <coughs> talking about eating, eating cats and dogs. Instead it, it, of making it so they got to eat cats and dogs, why don't you just go ahead and feed them? Again, it's a real to do. All the most of the Immigrants that I have ever met, that I've ever had dealing with, mainly, I mean, I remember when they put this roof on my house, it was a group of Mexicans. Well, they do something like, what? That's some hard working people. Folks come to America, they want the American dream. Ask them, they'll tell you, that's why they came. They're willing to, if you let them, they will come here. And be loyal citizens if you let them, if you treat them right. If you treat them right. And, and the children of Israel were mandated that the strangers among them. Let me look, I'm just going to share some scriptures with you so you get the idea. Uh, Exodus 22 and 21 says, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Exodus 23 and 9 says, also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You know what they went through. Now the problem in America, you got the folk who think that uh, because they were born here and their granddaddy was born here, guess what? Uh, Y'all, folks who came over on the Mayflower and stuff like that, they stole the land from the, the Native Americans, the, the Indians. They were the victims of genocide, mass genocide. So you need to remember that. Now they don't want you teaching that. They call that critical race theory. They don't want you criticizing the white race for what they have done in this country. Uh, uh, there are some people say they want to make America great again. And what they're saying is they want to go back to Jim Crow. But you can't go back. This, you, this land will never be a majority of, of Caucasian ever again. It just won't. So you need to get over it. And, if you, and when you do, it's going to be a better place. They, 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 the strangers are not poisoning the blood. And God understood that. Look what he said. That, uh, uh, and, uh, I'm going to go to Leviticus 17 and 8. And then Levit Leviticus, let me read Leviticus 17, 8 and 9. And thou shalt say unto them, Whenever, what, whatsoever man that be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you. Now, the, he's talking about the proselytes again. Thou offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice. The native born Jew and the proselyte, they both worship the same way. That's what he's talking about. So when these people have adopted the religious practices of the Jew, 
Okay, you get an immigrant come to America and they decide that they want to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. They, 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 they are determined to become citizens of America and they will do whatever it takes to become a naturalized citizen. So if you got folks who are willing to do what's necessary to become a naturalized citizen, instead of making it hard for them, don't get some. When you put them to work, pay them the, the right rate. Don't, don't, don't just hire them so you know you can pimp them. And that's what they like to do now. They, they hire a group of Mexicans and pay them under the table uh, for half the, the, the good rate. And they're going to do twice as much work. And, won't com and for the most part, won't complain. Because that's way more money than they ever made in Mexico. That uh, it, uh, 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 you give ten dollars an hour, where American workers go ain't they won't even step foot in the door unless you're gonna give them fifteen or twenty, and that's just the way it is. So, but let me just drop down. And look, look, he says. It was strangers that sojourn among you that offered the burnt offering of sacrifice and bringeth it not in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation speaks now to a responsibility on the part of those who are who are worshiping the true God. If, if, if they're willing to do it God's way, then you got to accept them. Now, let, let me read uh, Leviticus 19 and 34 because this kind of sums it all. This, this should be your, your immigration policy. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. My goodness. So them folks that, that want to, to ostracize, that want to vilify the strangers among us, this is what the word of God says. This is what the, this is the the commandment that the children of Israel were under, and even if it's not a commandment to us, let it be a, a guiding principle for those in America that want to develop. I'm talking about uh, these politicians that argue about immigration. Read the scripture. Some of y'all think y'all Christians. Read the scripture. See what God think about immigrants. He says, Thou shalt love him as thyself, for you are strangers. Now, to the, the white folk in America that got problems with brown and yellow and red people and black, well, they, your ancestors stole their land from the, from the red man stole the black man from his homeland and brought him here to work. But the scripture says, he's a stranger that dwelleth among you. He's a stranger to you, but you can't treat him like that. And, and the whole idea was so that everybody wins. Everybody benefit. And we're going to look at some of these other uh, uh, scriptures that uh, as we go through here, see the proselyte or, or the immigrant, uh, he needs to be accepted as long as he abides by the law, honors the, the ideas and the moral obligations required of the citizens of the nation. So guess what? If, if those immigrants come to America and they're willing to abide by the law and they're willing to do what it takes to assimilate into the culture, uh, now everybody want to do their own little thing and it's okay. But when it comes down to it, they're willing to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. If those folks, now you can't, the scripture already says uh, in order to be the president, you got to be born here. Just like the scripture said in order to be king, that they had to be a, a, they had to be a Jew in order to be a king of Israel. Still being uh, uh, some of the law, the concepts of the law were applied to our uh, national situation. But if we would apply it 
more detail. We'd apply in different situations. I think we'd be a lot better off. It wouldn't be as much strife in this country. Because instead of making it hard on folk, make it easy for them to assimilate. Uh, see the good that they bring. Don't look for just the bad. Because you're going to have criminals, you going to have folk, I mean, my goodness, you're going to have folk come from uh, who were born here that if they back up against the wall, they subject to throw some bricks. Folk who were born here. So you can always get to uh, some immigrants who they came because they back it up against the wall, and then when they got here, they facing hardships that <laughs> unimaginable, and uh, if they got their own issues. They gonna commit crime just like the folk who were born here commit crime. Now when we get to verse nine. Deuteronomy 23 and 8 says, The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in the third generation. Okay, let me go back. Let me, let, let me, I want you to see this. Thou shalt knock. Let me go back to verse 5. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam. But the reason why. Verse 4. Let me go back. I'm jumping the gun. Because why not the Moabites? And the, and the Amorite, verse 4 tells us why. Because they met you not with bread and water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, because they hired against thee Balaam the son of Beor. Remember when we did that in um, number 23? To hide Balaam to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. Though thou shalt not abhor the Edomite, for he is thy brother, thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Because the Egyptians weren't always mean to him, it's just that last generation. For, gener for 400 years, the Egyptians actually treated them good. But there arose a Pharaoh in Egypt who didn't know Joseph, and he began to change the policy. He saw the children of Israel as a threat and not the blessing that they actually were. But for a long time, Egyptians treated them good. So God said, don't get mad at the Egyptians. You can't blame the, all the Egyptians for uh, that last Pharaoh. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in the third generation. So, so the, the, the Edomite and Egyptian, they might, if they come, they can't participate in the, the rituals, but the grandchildren can. The third generation. Now, we get to verse 9, it talks about uncleanness in the camp. We get to verses 9 through uh, 14. Uncleanness in the camp. Uh, I'm not going to read verse or verse, but what, uh, in a nutshell, if a man done laid up with a woman, he done slipped out in the, in the middle of the night and done laid up with a woman, he can't come back into the camp, he got to bathe. <laughs> he done laid up with a woman, he got to bathe. Don't come back in the camp. You're bringing uncleanness into the camp and God is with you. Because God is with you, you cannot bring uncleanness into the camp. If most of these laws were designed to so that the children of Israel would maintain holy life and not contaminate the presence, don't contaminate the place where God is going to be. Now, how do we apply that to our everyday life? Uh, remember Romans 12 and 3. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it, it applies. So the, 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 the law was specific in that day, but it does apply in this day. 
the principle that we we may not be under the law, but we, but the overriding abiding principle is still valid. The whole idea is to say that evil is not in the land. You cannot let evil fester. You can't let it spread. Before you know it, you're going to end up with America. And you don't want that. Yeah, I said it. Uncleanness in the camp. Uh, and if you... Let me... I want you to read this part. I got to read this part right here to you. And... Um, Verse 12. When thou have a place also without the can, will thou go for basically when you gotta use the bathroom, use the out go to the outhouse. Even the soldiers, when they were the soldiers were in a camp. And remember now they the soldiers that are encamped together in tight uh, quarters, and you got to use you got to relieve yourself. They were told they got to dig a hole. Look at verse thirteen. Thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it, and it shall be when thou ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith. Thou shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Dig a hole, poop in the hole, and cover it up. You can't do like the dogs and leave a pile of poop in the in, so somebody could walk in it. Common sense stuff, cleanliness. So they, 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 they require them to be morally clean, but physical cleanliness. After you done laid up with a woman, take a bath. You can't come to the congregation and you done laid up smelling like you done, done laid up with somebody. Simple stuff. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall the camp, shall thy camp be holy, and he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. So if you're just nasty, God gonna walk away from you. That's the idea. Now, from verse 15 until the end of the chapter. Just miscellaneous laws. And the first one, this is what the folk in America, this is what Harriet Tubman understood. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee even among you in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates. Where it liketh him best, thou shalt not impress him. If somebody escaped if a, if a, a runaway slave that came to you, you can't send him back to his master. Uh, you know them folk back in uh, 1860, 1850, they ain't like that in America. They, were, they weren't having no part of that. A runaway slave? <laughs> See, the Jew, if a runaway slave made it to uh, the house of another Jew, you can't send him back to his master. That was the law. No. Verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. My goodness. That's pretty. The LGBTQ don't want to hear that, but there it is right there. Why? Because you don't want to bring uncleanness to the camp. We can't make God like what we like. Okay? It's just that simple. Some things are an abomination to God, and that's what he said. We can't celebrate what God don't celebrate. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. Don't come bring some of uh, you, uh, 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 you pimping women, and you're going to bring your money to the house of the Lord, and you... Um, you think that's going to keep you good? Don't bring that. Don't bring that dirty money here. Boy, he, you over there laughing. You ain't never seen that, did you? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I remember years ago, 
one of my nephews got involved with some thugs and he thought his mama was going to be impressed. He brought, tried to bring her some, some dope money. She said, no, I would let my lights go off. You know how many mothers, if they adopted that principle, their sons would stop slanging and gang banging? The reason why they do it is because their mamas encourage it. Their mama take that dirty money and spend it. Uh, uh, you know, they still go over here, can uh, get, they, uh, get, the, get mama's uh, 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 toenails done and stuff. I mean, you know, you want money in the house. I, I get that. But money in the house is one thing, but money in the house of God, God said, don't bring it. Don't bring it here. Don't bring the dirty money to the house of God. Now, I, I think our families would be a lot better off if mothers were discouraged by don't accept that dirty money when your children who are, who are doing uh, racketeering and doing all kinds of stuff, uh, don't, don't, don't accept it. Let your lights get cut off. I know you don't want to do that. You don't want to hear that. But you can't encourage your son to engage in wickedness. You can't encourage your daughters to engage in wickedness. They're going to turn the tricks all night. They're going to come home and they're going to hand you some money and you're going to be okay with that. My goodness. I went there because I, is that, you know, I ain't make this up. There it is back right there in scripture. Now when we get to verse 29, it talks about lending money. They were, uh, uh, you can't lend money to your brother with interest. Now, unto a stranger thou may lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend with interest. Hmm? You can't tax him. That's your brother. Why well, was this law in place? So that all your people can come up. Now, let me get to this. Look what he's saying, verse 20. Unto a stranger thou may lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to go into the land where thou goest to possess it. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord, thou shalt not slack to pay it, but the Lord thy God will surely require of thee. Don't promise you're going to do something for God and then don't do it. That's what he's saying. But that which is gone out of thy lip, thou shalt keep to perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. And when thou come into thy neighbor's vineyard, thou mayest eat grapes, thou feel with thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any into a vessel. Here's the principle. If you run across somebody else's field and they got grapes, if you can eat them right then, it's okay. But you can't put none in a basket, you can't put none in your pockets. What you're going to eat right then is okay. But you can't put none in a bag. You can't put none in your pocket. You can't put none in a basket. That's stealing. See, the, 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 he had laws in place so that the poor people could be taken care of. And when thou comest into a, a standing corn of thy neighbor, Thou mayest pluck the ears with thy hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. You can't use no tools. If you can get it with your hand, it's okay. If you got to use a hoe or a, a, a machete or a sickle to, 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 to harvest somebody else's stuff, that's stealing. Real simple. And, and verse 20, chapter 24, dealing with divorce. Um, chapter 20, you, you know, you're dealing with the law, the verse, first four verses, and basically dealing with divorce in a nutshell. If a man divorces his wife, she can get remarried. And if her second husband dies, the first husband can't remarry. Simple as that. That's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, and verse 4, her former husband who sent her away may not take her to be his wife again. After that she is defiled 
For that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So you, you can't remarry somebody you done put away the first time. When you had it the first time, you should have kept her. For the man that taken a new wife, he should not go out to, to war. Now, here's this I like this one. You know, a, a, a newlywed is exempt from going to the war for a whole year. So you can keep your, and the scripture says, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. Okay? No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. Uh, whatever man used for, to, to, to feed his family with, you can't make him put that up as a uh, collateral. That's really what it boils down to. You cannot take a man's livelihood away. See, these laws were designed to, uh, to mitigate and minimize poverty. Poverty does not have to last a generation to generation. Every generation has the ability to come up. That's what these laws would do. That's what they would do. That's what they were designed for. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and make merchandise of them, verse 7, it's a prohibition against human trafficking. So if anybody ever thought that God was okay with slavery. And you pretty much all the laws that they put in the, in the Holy Land. Oh yeah. Well, they, they apply there, but the principle apply universal. God, God was not in favor. Now he didn't understand that you know people lose a war instead of um, instead of uh, killing everybody. That you know, one nation they, you send out your champion, they send out their champion. Whoever champion won, the losers became the slaves of the victors. That was part. That was how cultures went. Uh, that's why Rome, Rome conquered somebody. Um, that Rome would conscript the soldiers of the. Uh, remember that movie, uh, Gladiator. Uh, 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 Maximus was a Spaniard. That's why they call him the Spaniard. So when they went to Spain and conquered Spain, where well, the Spanish uh, uh, soldiers became Roman soldiers. And when Maximus fell out of favor, he ended up a general, but he ended up a, 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 a gladiator because um, somebody didn't, high up didn't like him. That was a fictitious story, but it was typical of that culture and that time. Uh, take heed of the plague of leprosy. Thou observe diligently to do all that the priests and the Levites shall teach you, as I commanded them. Remember what the Lord thy God did to Miriam, by the way. So recognize, observe the laws. Especially something like leprosy, because it's fair. So you treat leprosy the way you treat COVID now. We were in quarantine. If a, uh, a disease or some kind of um, pandemic or epidemic occurred, you need to make, you, you, the, the law of leprosy was a precursor to, how, you, the law of leprosy, if you followed that, you could have came through the pandemic. Isolate the infected. If you know the infected, let everybody know. So the principle apply. Even if the law does not, it, it is not a law for our time, the principle of the law is still a valid principle because it protects the people from unintended infection or unwanted infection. When thou dost lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go to his house to fetch his pledge. Somebody, you lend somebody something, you can't kick his door in and go get it and collect. 
you, you know, you, you, you lend him something because he needed it, and it's time to pay, he didn't have it. You don't go, you go to his house, but you can't go in this, go, you go to the door, you don't go inside the house and try to collect it. That's what he's saying. And if, if the poor man thou shalt not sleep with his pledge, somebody then uh, had, to, had to put the upon his coat. You got to get at night time the man sleep with his coat. You got to give him his coat back. You can come back and get it tomorrow, but the night the, at night time the man got to sleep with his coat. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun go down, that he may sleep in his own room and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in the land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and set his heart upon it, lest he cry to thee unto the Lord, and sin be unto thee. If you owe somebody to work for you, and you owe him some money, pay the man his money. Because his children got to eat too. The father shall not put to death for the children, neither shall children be put to death for their fathers. <coughs> Every man should be put to death for his own sin. Now that man whose son done shot somebody, uh, they're going to arrest the daddy, because he the one bought the, bought the, the, the rifle. You know, I know a lot of uh, uh, people who buy guns for their children. And they teach the children how to use them. Most of the boys, you know, the daddy at home, he and his son to hunt with him, and he'll buy him his own gun one of these days. And, and teach, teach him how to use it. Hopefully teach him proper gun safety. But if that son go, go get stupid and go shoot up the school, According to this, the son and the father should not be held liable for what the child do. Uh, in our society, we want to blame the parent too. We're going to lock them up. They're going to jail. They go to jail. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the strangers, nor the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. All of these laws are designed to, to keep the poor from being to from staying there forever. The next generation has to have the ability to come up. Jesus said the poor will always be among you. The poor will always be among you because you're gonna have folk who don't want to do what God say do when it comes down to dealing with the poor. I was watching the TV show, um uh, actually I was watching on on, on the internet, but it got with um was uh, interviewing um, uh, the guy from Mark Cuba who does Shark Tank. In the premise of Shark Tank, what Mark Cuban does with his billions, he will, if somebody got a good idea, he will use his billions to finance your dream. I love that. See, when you're responsible and you want to see somebody else come up, use your billions Use your money to help somebody else come up. Mark, I don't know if Mark knew it, but he's actually living by this principle. So thou cuttest down thine harvest, and I like this part. Dealing with the, the gleaning, the, when you harvest your field and you leave something, you can't go back and get it. Uh, see, I picked oranges before, and uh, they have us to get, they want to get every orange out that tree. And uh, the, 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 amongst the Jews, if you worked, if you did your harvest and you left something, you can't go back and get it. In fact, the edges you leave them alone. You don't even get them. The poor people get to get to do that. After the harvest is over, one edge you leave that edge for the for the poor people so that they can go and get it, and that's how they eat. That was the that was the that was the the 
food stamp system of Israel in that day. Wasn't no food stamp. They had bigger the food stamp. You want to something to eat, go out there and get it. You, in fact, you can uh, that's the time to use a basket. Now, if you're just walking through the field and you can get enough to eat right then, that's fine. But when, they, when the harvest is, is being taken care of, uh, at the end of the harvest, the stuff that's left, you could, the, the gleaners can go in. That's how, that's how Ruth met Boaz. I read the book of Ruth. You see that story. When thou beatest down the olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of the vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. My goodness. You can't get it all. Leave some for somebody else. Don't take all the resources for yourself. Now, chapter 25 is continuation of chapter 24. If there be a, con a controversy between men, they shall come into, and they come into judgment, that the judges may judge them, and they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten before his face, according to his fault, by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed it, lest he shall exceed and beat him above these many stripes. Then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. The, the easy reading version puts it this way. Because more than 40 means that their life is not important to you. You ain't trying to beat somebody to death. Remember now when Jesus was last, they gave him 39 lashes. Because the 40 might kill him. And for them, they used the cat of nine tails, which um, it didn't take but two or three to make you want to, you know, that thing you never be played with. Verse 4, thou shalt not muzzle the ox for treading out the corn. If you got an animal that's used, that you use to plow up your field, or to, uh, to that's pulling a wagon in your field, and that, 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 that animal uh, uh, eat some of the grain, eat some of, the, some of the stuff that you got him hauling, you can't beat him. You got to let him eat it. He's doing the work for you. That's the principle. So you're going to treat your workers good and you treat your animals good. Because if you don't take care of the animals, they can't do the work for you. Now, verse 5, it begins with dealing with what's called uh, elaborate marriages. If a, uh, and uh, this is basically... This is basically uh, uh, when somebody dies, if a man dies and he doesn't have any children, his brother has to, if you got a brother, your brother has to marry your wife and the first child that your wife has, that your widow has, her child, your brother's child, actually gets your inheritance so that his name is not cut off. Because when the children of Israel are each given their land grants, you wanted to stay in that family. So that's why the, the blessing of the firstborn applies to him. Now, now her second child becomes your first child, and he gets your right of the firstborn. The right of the firstborn, that's a powerful thing. That's the right of the firstborn is what Esau despised and Jacob coveted. Jacob tricked Esau. He ain't tricking him. He just well, he kind of tricked him. He tricked him out of his first out of his birthright. But had he not been so carnal, he wouldn't have went for it. 
Then if a man take not his wife's brother and let his brother's wife go, well, basically she could, she, really she didn't have anything she could do. He had, he had the responsibility, but sometimes the man may, might not want it. And verse 7 tells us, if a man take not his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate and to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up his brother a name in, my, in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then she shall be his brother. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loose. That's about as bad as it gets. That's like calling, that's, that's cussing somebody out. Uh, now, we, in verse 11, we got some more miscellaneous laws. When men strive together one with another, now, I like this one. This one, this one actually made me laugh. <laughs> when men strive together one with another, the wife of one draws near unto to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and put it forth her hand, and take him by the secret. Thou, then thou shalt cut off her hand, thine eye, Shall not pity her. It's all right for you to help your husband, but you can't kick no man. Another your, your husband fight another man, and you're gonna kick him in the stone. You're gonna grab him by his, you know, because men can't be somebody grab you by your for your private part. You you know, you, you know you. I don't care what your fight game is. Um, you can't handle that. Men weren't designed for that. So they can cut her hand off if she did something like that. That that's to keep fight semi fair. Verse thirteen: Thou shalt not have have a bag of divers' weight, great and small. Uh, in that day, in our big commerce, they have a weights. They have a blue balancing scale. So you know, you're trying to sell somebody a pound. You put a one pound weight on uh, one side, and you put. You start adding produce, and when it got to the middle, you know that was a pound. Well, uh, I had a buddy who used to sell weed a long time ago, and I'll tell you what he used to do. I will call his name, but he's still alive, and uh, we, we okay, but this is what he used to do. He put about three or four pebbles of rocks in a pound of weed. So instead of you getting 16 pounds, you ain't getting about uh, uh, 16 ounces, you ain't getting about 15 ounces. He done stole an ounce. A weed out of every pound, he done rock down the pound. You know that, that that's that that's something else there, but uh, you can't do that. The whole idea is don't cheat people. You're gonna do commerce. Don't don't cook the books. That's what got Donald Trump in all that trouble in New York, because he was cooking his books. You're gonna do business. Be fair. Don't tell somebody it's a pound and ain't with 15 ounces and 15.3 ounces. You're trying to sell it for a pound. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure thou shalt have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when he come out of Egypt. How they met thee in the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble. See, what, they, what, what the Amalekites did when they were marching through, the, what the, the Amalekites wouldn't go up against the strong people. The folk who were lagging from behind, the old feeble people, they attacked them and took their stuff. Come on, you're going to attack somebody, go against mano a mano. And, and uh, that's why the Malachi had such a, uh, uh, that's why uh, God did not think highly, kindly of the Malachi. Look at verse 19. 
Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for the inheritance to possess it, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. You gotta learn your lesson. Be fair. Because as long as you do right by the people, God will do right by you. If you do right by the strangers, God will do right by you. The immigrants in America are not the, they're, they're not poisoning the blood of the nation. If you do right by them, they will enrich the nation. Because the work they do is going, is going, is going to benefit society. If they, as long as they assimilate into the culture and embrace the concept of America, then you need to embrace them. Now, obviously, there are some that you don't want whose backgrounds are anti antithesis to what we believe that we hold dear in America. But if they can come here and want to live by the law of this land and embrace the dreams and ideals that we uh, espouse and they want to be a part of what we do, it will be in our best interest to, make, to see what we can do to make it happen. Don't, 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 pray, don't vex them so that there are two and three and four generations in the wind and, and they still just bad off five generations later because of what you did to them. And that's what they did to our people. That's what they did to our people. And if you don't believe I'm more, what I want you to read, this is the most, one of my favorite books, is the, the Miseducation of the Negro by Carter Woodson. Get that book and read it. Now, when you read it, I want you to promise me one thing. You're not going to go around and, and want to slap white people, okay? Because the ones that in this day, they're not the culprits. But their grandfather, their forefather sure were. And that, 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 that has poisoned. The miseducation of the Negro has poisoned the lifeblood of America. Not the immigrants who come. But the way that we have done, the way that they have done some of the people that were here, the indigenous, our ancestors. You want to make America great again, repent of that evil. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to share with the children one more time. I thank you for just showing us this. And just that we, so we can, we can be a better nation, that we can be a better, we can be better families, we can be better communities, we can be better soldiers in the army of the living God. So we thank you, Lord. We honor you today with our life, with our treasure, with our thoughts, with our heart. Forgive us of our sin and our prayers are not hindered. And just let your will be done in our lives move in a fantastic way to, to bring about a change in this land that your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and, and pray and seek your face. So we thank you, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. All right, now, we'll see y'all. going to pick it up in chapter 26 next time. Y'all didn't think that the Old Testament was this good, did you? Did you? Come on, be honest with me. Now, anybody blessed by this, share it with your friends. Don't y'all be so stingy. Share it with your friends. Um, go on, get the... I got a lot of content on YouTube. I'm, I, I challenge you, go to YouTube, subscribe. I don't think I got 20 subscribers. I should have 1,000 subscribers. Uh, those that I got too much content, you, you go and anybody want to be a preacher, anybody think the Lord then uh, call you to preach and do ministry, uh, everything I've done on YouTube, I, the, the notes are right there on the screen. Um, you, you know, just 
get your pimps and people with you and just steal everything I put on there. It ain't copyrighted. I don't care if you use it. Okay? Um, the Lord give it to me and I give it out freely. So I, you know, but now if you're blessed by it, give. Um, just give. You can uh, use a uh, dollar sign green WL is my cash app and Zell is 689-246-5892. Any gift of any amount as your help. I'm going to put the content up there regardless. <laughs> but if, when folks start giving a little bit more, I can do, uh, uh, I can put a, a website together that would basically be a, a school, online, an online class for just um, for, for doing God's work. But, um, you know, y all, y all, y all, if you just help a brother out, that's all I'm saying. You know, I don't be... You, I'm gonna do the work whether you give me a nickel or not. But if you if you do, I appreciate it. I'm gonna keep doing the work, but regardless, the content is still coming. You're gonna be blessed by it. If you've been blessed, share it with somebody else so they can be blessed. But those of you that know you want a do you want a deeper understanding of God's word, get into it. Cause uh, I tell you, I have uh, not uh, I've come to realize just how great God is and how how fantastic the Word of God is. And, uh, nothing is as uh, as delivering as the word of God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy, the only true and wise God, the glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forever, and all of God's people say amen. Uh, we see y'all next Sunday at 1030. Uh, meet us at 7474. West Colonial Drive at the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, I see my boy, my, my buddies. We're gonna see have IHOP this coming Saturday. Um, we had a baptism schedule for the 28th, but I mean, we're gonna have to postpone that. At least I will, because one of my cousins um, passed at uh, George Ford in um, in Gainesville, and I intend to be at his uh, home going service. So. Um, yeah, so just keep the keep the family lifted up in prayer as we mourn the loss of a loved one. We we'll see y'all next time.